Hey, good morning, everybody. Happy Halloween. I was very tempted to dress up on stage, but I figured that would be a little bit distracting, so I refrained. You're welcome. All right. Well, this morning, y'all, if y'all don't mind standing and singing with us, we are going to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus. This first song that we're going to sing is called God So Loved. One, two, three, four. seconds and greet those around you. Say good morning.
worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out. so much for joining us here in person and online. Um, we are glad to see you. We are glad that you are here. Um, we have nursery available in the back hallway all morning for those who need it. And kids worship through grade five is also going on in the back hallway at this hour. If you are a guest, please stick around in the lobby for a few minutes following the service. We would love to get to know you. So you received a connection card when you entered today. Please fill that out so that we can know that you are with us. Um, we invite guests to fill it out as well so that we can connect with you after today's service. Ushers will pick those cards up in a few moments. And if you are online um, to register your attendance, please just leave a comment with your name. Alpha continues this Wednesday night, and we would love to see you there. The free dinner begins at 5.30, and the Alpha program begins at 6 p.m. Everything is open to the public. Nursery will be available all evening, and there are classes for all ages. Alpha is a safe place for people seeking faith in God to discuss their thoughts, and it helps all people find their own purpose in life. Please register for the free dinner on each week's connection card so our volunteer cooks can plan. If you are online, you can register for dinner by calling or emailing the church office. So next Sunday is All Saints Day, November 7th. We will be recognizing our loved ones who have passed away since last November. Please submit names to the church office if you wish to include a relative in our remembrance. So WAVES Girls Conference for girls in grades 6 through 12 
is November 5th through the 7th in Destin, Florida. Waves encourages young women to discover their identity in Christ, to equip them to make waves for him in their homes, communities, and world. We will leave Sarah Land UMC on Friday, November 5th at 4 p.m. and return Sunday afternoon. If you'd like more information, please find Dan McKee or um, contact the church office. We will soon begin a new Discover Sarah Land UMC class for those who are considering membership in the church. For more information, please contact the church office. So today we will begin a four-part sermon series titled, What One Life Can Do. We will hear how Martin Luther, William Tyndale, Mother Teresa, and Francis Asbury rocked our world for Christ. Today is Reformation Sunday, which is the day that the church recognizes the contributions of Martin Luther and his refocusing the church on justification by faith in scripture. All right, thank you, Laurieann, for uh, leading us in worship band, and uh, glad you're all here. I'm Pastor Mike. I want to welcome all of you. I like to take a moment in this prayer time, not only lift up some prayers that we might have, but to kind of tell you what God is doing in our church because it's amazing. So, so many of you might see us on Sunday if you're online just on Sunday, but we are active all throughout the week. And I, I wish I could tell you how many people I see that come in and serve somewhere that nobody else sees. They're doing something behind the scenes and they never look for affirmation or recognition and just are so thankful. I mean, this is, this is a happening place every day of the week and we're thankful for that. Uh, this week we're going to lift up Nathan Pope. If you know Nathan, he's going in for surgery this week, so we want to pray for him. And... Um, one, one thing I just want to lift up and just say we're really we're proud of is uh, Dan is our director of family ministries here, and he has been, over the last several weeks, been selected to be at Satsuma High School once a week and working with the Women's Resource Center there and teaching a class uh, on healthy relationships. And it's really a great opportunity. Uh, so we're doing a lot of things in the walls of the church, but, but our church has a DNA of being outside in the community and serving our community, and he's been doing that, and we're really proud of him, not, not only having an opportunity to interact with those students, but working with a great ministry like the Women's Resource Center. Center and being a part of that. Well, today is, uh, in our country, it's Halloween, uh, but in uh, the church calendar is a special day. It's called uh, Reformation Sunday, and churches around the world today are, are remembering what we're going to be talking about, which was how Martin Luther launched a revolution, a reformation on the whole world that, that you might not realize how much, just how much it has changed your life and, our, and your church, and the way you worship, and the way you pray. I mean, it's completely, radically different because of the boldness of one man to take a firm stand for the word of God. So I'm really excited today to be able to, to share a little bit about that. And, and so as we go in, in prayer today, uh, I want to thank God for you being here, that God has something for you today that you needed, something you needed to hear, or something that you need to do that's meant just for you as we pray for the Spirit to come. Let's go to God in prayer Lord, we thank you for this church, and we thank you that that this church can be a bold witness for Christ in this community. Um, There are so many who uh, go through trials and tribulations without their Savior, without the knowledge or relationship of God. And so we pray that we would be a light for those who are hurting, uh, that we would help to show the way back to God for those in whatever capacity um, or opportunity that you present to us. And Lord, we pray your Holy Spirit to be with us today. Because we're here, and I believe, God, there has to be a reason that each person is here and hearing what will be our message in a few moments. And we pray your spirit will come for each one of us to receive what we need to receive from you today. Lord, we want to pray for those who need your healing. We pray for Nathan. God, we want to thank you for Dan and his ministry uh, with the students of Satsuma. And God, for each one of us as we go forward later today and through the rest of the week, that you'll use us as a light in the dark world. God, we pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior. Amen. At this time, church, I'm going to invite the ushers to come on up. They're going to collect connection cards. If you've never been to Alpha on a Wednesday night, I I hope you'll give it a chance. Just come on this Wednesday. We'd love to have you. Free dinner. Great, great discussion. I think you'll be blessed by being there. Uh, If you're online and you want to come too, you can let us know or just come. Come at 5.30 on Wednesday night and be blessed by that. This is time to give tithes and offerings too. 
Uh, and if you ever have any prayer needs, you can put those on those cards or email the church office, and we want you to know that you will be prayed for if you let us know uh, what you're struggling through. Last week, um, I just, I love this song so much. It's a really pretty song about who our Savior is and who, who it is that we sing to and why we sing to him. Jesus Messiah, name above. Jesus Messiah, 
we could spend eternity in heaven with our Father. And that fact, it just never ceases to amaze me and fill my heart with joy. And I pray that that same joy is here and present in this house today, in your house today, God. I pray that as Pastor Mike brings this lesson that we learn and that we see the example of what our ancestors and our forefathers did to glorify your name and to build your kingdom and that we can learn and have the confidence and the faith to do the same thing for your church, God, to spread your gospel to those who need to hear it. Jesus, we love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing for the scripture. Today's scripture is Romans chapter 1, 16 through 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So today I want to begin with a story and tell you about one time uh, there was a Baptist preacher in the year 1934 who needed to go to a meeting in the country of Germany. So his church sent him. He went over to Germany. Germany. It was the first time he'd ever been to Germany before. And while he was there, he was blown away by learning more about this character, Martin Luther. I mean, he'd heard about him before, but really didn't know all of his story. Uh, the Baptist preacher's name was Michael King, and the more he heard more and more about this uh, person, Martin Luther, the more he was impressed, so much so, that when Michael King returned back to the United States after his trip to Germany, he decided to change his name to reflect the name Martin Luther his, change, uh, his name changed from Michael King to Martin Luther King Sr. And changed the name of his son as well from Michael King Jr. to Martin Luther King Jr. We're looking at this man today, Martin Luther, who inspired even folks like this. You might recognize the name Martin Luther King Jr., but what was it 
that so inspired this Baptist preacher and his son, another Baptist preacher, to literally change their names to reflect what this man Martin Luther had done. We might not even realize it, but Martin Luther has likely changed uh, everyone in the room, everyone who's watching this message in ways that I I believe are incalculable. Uh, But yet we really don't know a lot about this story. Uh, many of us haven't had time to really reflect on it, and today we're going to be looking at the story of Martin Luther, but, but what, I, what I want is not for this to be a history lesson, the whole point of what we're doing today, and then throughout this sermon series, which I'm really excited about, we're going to be looking at Martin Luther and William Tyndale and Mother Teresa and Francis Asbury. Now, these are not just history lessons, these are people's own real stories. These are real testimonies of real people. And because I've had an opportunity to really go deep in some of these stories, I've just been reminded of the fact that these people are just like you and me. They weren't born with halos around their head and floating on clouds. Like The truth is that each one of these went through really, really hard times just like you are. I mean, some of them had really bad medical problems. Uh, some of them really struggled with depression. Uh, some of them doubted at times. I mean, A lot of us go through difficult times like this. But what makes them stand out is when they were going through difficult times, they made amazing choices for God and chose to put God first in the middle of these really, really difficult circumstances. And what I'm hoping for you in these messages, not only will you um, come to love their personal testimonies, I, I believe personal testimonies are our greatest way to share faith with people who don't know God. Much more than just teaching them what we believe is to tell our own story of faith. And so I'm hoping for you today that as you hear this incredible testimony of faith, not only will it inspire you, but it will encourage you in your own difficult situations and the own traumas and tragedies of your life that you might put God first and that he will use those difficult things for his glory. I want to put up, though, on the screen right now a picture of what Martin Luther Looks like this is one of his more famous images of what this man looked like. But his story uh, begins when he was born. He was born uh, in the 1400s. And in, he was born in the country of Germany. His parents were really, uh, they, they went to church. They were Roman Catholic. But then again, everyone was Roman Catholic in Western Europe at that time. There were no other choices Everyone was. In fact, that is one of the incredible things that Martin Luther uh, launched upon Western Europe is now we have different denominations, Lutherans and Presbyterians and Methodists and Baptists and non-denominational churches and on and on, Pentecostal, because of what Martin Luther did. But at the time that Martin Luther was born in the 1400s, there was only one denomination, and he was born into that. Um, But his family wasn't particularly religious, his dad's real goal in, in raising his family was to raise his family up out of poverty into, from being a peasant uh, and, and to make a name for themselves. His dad was in the mining industry, and he worked really, really hard. He worked hard to give his family a really good upbringing. And when Martin Luther was a boy, his dad noticed that Martin was really intelligent. And when he who talked with Martin and and spent some time with him, he realized this, this is a person that we can really invest in. I mean, he's smart, and we can save up money, and maybe he'll go to college, and this is exactly what they hoped for Martin Luther. Um, And they saved up his money. He was brilliant, went on to college and learned multiple languages. You know, how easy is that, right? He just learned, you know, Greek and Latin and all these languages with no problem because he was brilliant, Um, And his dad had a vision that someday his son could go on and be a lawyer, which in that time and in that place, that was one of the more prestigious jobs that you could get. And so this is exactly what his dad pursued for Martin Luther. He went on and he, he went to law school and he started studying law. Now, if Martin Luther had finished law school and if he had gone on and become a lawyer, He would have made a lot of money. He would have had a lot of prestige in his community. And we would never have heard of him today. We wouldn't. His life took on a completely different path than that. 
in his life, he would have been a lawyer and made a lot of money and gone that path had not, what I'm going to tell you next, happened to him. One day, the year that he was walking home one day from law school in the year 1505, he wanted to come home and to see his parents from law school. And as he was walking home from law school, out of nowhere, there was this tremendous lightning and thunderstorm unlike he had ever seen before and I mean just lightning was literally hitting the ground near him and he was scared to death and in fact there was one lightning bolt that hit the ground right next to him and it blew him into the air and he flew through the air and landed in the mud nearby Uh, he he genuinely believed in that moment that this was a sign from God that God was trying to get his attention that maybe there was something he had done wrong that maybe he'd messed up on something and God was trying to get his attention and he genuinely believed he was going to die in that lightning storm in that moment and so out of desperation uh, thinking that he was going to die he called out to God well actually the way he knew to call out to God was to call out to a patron saint And that's how he had been taught. It happened to be St. Anne, who's the patron saint of mining, like his dad's industry that he had been a part of. And so he called out to St. Anne in this prayer, and he said, St. Anne, save me, and if you will, I will become a monk. And it's interesting. Have you ever kind of done a prayer like that? Like you're... You're in a moment of desperation. God, please help me pass this test. And if you do, I will go to church or I will read my Bible every day. Um, There there are these moments that sometimes you just feel that moment of desperation and you just call out to God. And what I have discovered is when when we do that, uh, the thing that we tell God that we're going to do is, is something that we've known for a very long time we should have been doing anyway. It just comes to a moment of desperation where maybe God does get our attention and we know what we ought to be doing, but it's something like that that really jolts us back to to doing the thing that we know that God wants us to do. And this is just my personal opinion about Martin Luther is that maybe God had been putting it on his heart for some time to go on, to answer a call to be in ministry, possibly to go on and be a monk. Maybe that's something he knew God wanted him to do and it it was tough to take that step. But in this moment, he believed maybe God was trying to get his warning, his attention to him. And in that moment, he, he decided, I'm going to be a monk. The moment he called out and said, I will be a monk, the thunderstorm stopped. And he walked on to his home to tell his mom and dad the new news. <laughs> Do you think his dad was happy with the news that he would become a monk? Anybody? Not at all. (laughs) Not at all. Can you imagine being that dad and you had put all of your investment, saved up for years to try to better your son, saved up for college and you're sending him away and then your son comes home and says, I want to be a monk. Monks don't make any money. (laughs) Uh, Monks don't have any prestige. And monks don't have families. They don't get married and have children. And so all of these dreams that his dad had for Martin Luther in that moment, it just crushed him. We were in a, an alpha meeting last Wednesday night, and there was a quote that I really loved. And the, the quote was, you've just got to be you because everyone else is taken. <laughs> you just got to be you. Everyone else is taken. So many of us try to please other people. And we try to live up to other people's expectations, but I truly believe every one of you has a very unique plan from God. And you are called to be something and to do something that no one else is going to be or do. It means your life is going to look very different than other people's if you live into the call of what God wants you to do. And it's certainly the case with Martin Luther. I mean, he was a fish swimming against the flow. And what he's going to do next in his life is do, he's going to be doing something that nobody, literally, anywhere, had done before. And by doing so, by living out him being him, who God wanted him to be, he changed the world. And so Martin Luther decided, I'm going to go on to, the, to be a monk. And the very next morning, he told his parents the news the night before, the very next morning, packed up, and he left for the monastery. And so he headed off to the monastery. And here's a picture of the monastery, and it's still there today. It's a monastery that's in use in ministry, in the Lutheran denomination. 
and, and you can go and visit that monastery. And it's also interesting, if you ever get to go to, to Europe or in, uh, Germany someday, you can find a big monument at that spot where the lightning bolt struck the ground and where Martin Luther decided he needed to become a monk. It's a, a big monument that's right there. Uh, and you can see, see where that event happened. And so when he was choosing a, a monastery to go to, he had several choices. But he decided to pick this one, an Augustinian monastery, because it was the strictest, most severe, uh, devout monastery he could find anywhere. He wanted the strictest, most sincere, because that, he, he wanted the real deal. And so he entered into the monastery, and he took those vows of being a monk, which is poverty, a vow of poverty, and a vow of celibacy. And every day, he woke up early, and he prayed, and he studied and he studied philosophy and history, he studied Aristotle. He studied all the things that the church asked him to study. And he worked really, really hard day in and day out. And this, this became his life, the way that he served. Um, there was a problem, though. One of the things that Luther really struggled in the monastery with was, was doubt. Even though he was religious, and even though he was a monk, he didn't believe he was saved. I mean, he lost sleep over this fact. He, he, he was losing weight. He was struggling with this fact, thinking there are things in my life that are keeping me from going to heaven. And part of the reason that he really struggled with this is because this was part of the church's teachings that he was receiving and that he was hearing. So, for example, Romans 1.17 says this, and he would read this, and it would be preached in churches, the righteous will live by faith. And so when he read these words, and the way that it was being taught, this particular phrase, he would read it. The righteous will live by faith, meaning right people, the ones who live right, will live eternally. Let me say it another way. Perfect people get to go to heaven. And so when he was understanding the scripture that way, it, it totally bothered him to a point of paranoia because he realized he had imperfections in him. And so every day he would go to the priest and confess his sins, literally spending two or three hours with the priest trying to confess every little possible sin that he might have committed because he realized if he didn't do so that he was going to hell. And it caused emotional turmoil. It caused depression. He never felt satisfied. And here's the interesting thing. Even though he's in a monastery around all kinds of religious people, nobody could help him. And so he continued with his, his struggle of those things. So he, this was part of, of what was going on internally. But there was something else going on when he got to the seminary. And it was this. He got introduced to the Bible um, he read the Bible, and it was in the Latin language. It's one of the languages that he got to study. And this is my Latin Bible here, and this is, this is the only Bible that they would have had, the only translation. And so fortunately, because he knew languages, he could read the Bible in the only language available to him, which was Latin, and he was reading and reading and reading. Um, he had never even seen a Bible until his mid-20s. And it was actually pretty rare to have a Bible in those days because this is before the printing press. And uh, in order to have a Bible, you had to have one person that would literally copy it with a pen. And it took months and months of full-time work to have one Bible. And therefore, most people didn't have a Bible. Even most churches didn't have a Bible. And the only language it was written in was Latin. And most people didn't know Latin so you had a lot of priests and teachers of the church who were doing what I do for a living had never once in their life read the Bible because they didn't know Latin and they didn't have a Bible, so what were they going to do? But here Martin Luther had this rare opportunity of actually getting to read this text and studying it, and it began to have a profound impact on his life because he was reading things in the Bible itself that he had no idea about. I mean, I believe that's what the Bible does to us. I've, uh, in my life, from, from start to finish, I've read through the Bible in, you know, in a year's time or so, about a dozen different times I've read through the Bible from start to finish. And each time I read through the Bible, um, and I read a few chapters every day, it's amazing to me, just about every day I'll read something and I will think to myself, I do not remember that. <laughs> 
how, how could I have read it so many times and studied it, and, and I don't remember this point. Or if it's not something that I've learned for the day, it's, it's the time that I read it when I'm going through something in my life, and I'll read something, and I'll be like, wow, that is exactly what I needed to hear today. And God gives me direction, and I really believe that's how God guides us. And, and so, I, I mean, I find that it transforms my life every day. Maybe it's something that I do or say that needs to be changed a little bit. And, and this, this is something I believe that the word of God now available to all of us is something that, that I would challenge you to consider doing, even if it's five minutes a day, is spending time in God's word, reading something and reflecting on what God has for you because, because you can only be you. But to discover the you that God wants you to be, you need to be hearing from the word of God and what he desires for you to be. And so Martin Luther was reading every day, and it was changing him. He was learning things that he didn't know and studying things he, he hadn't ever heard before. And one of those things that he began to notice was, diff- was I'm going to put a picture up here. This man here was named Johann Tetzel. And Johann Tetzel was a salesman. Um, have you ever played Monopoly and there's that card in Monopoly that's called Get Out of Jail Free? It's a card that you can use. Well, Johann Tetzel is kind of like that card, except he was selling Get Out of Hell Free cards, literally. I mean, he was going around and selling these things called indulgences, where uh, he would say, and I don't know what the exact price was, but let's say it was 100 bucks. He would say, if you give me 100 bucks, you're going to be able to get granny out of hell. I mean, let's say you lost your granny a year or so ago. Uh, Johann Tetzel comes to your town and notice you've never read the Bible before. I mean, here's a spiritual authority coming and saying something to you, and he says, your granny is burning in the flames right now, and if you give me $100, I will sell you this ticket, an indulgence, and with it, your granny will get to spring out of hell and go to heaven. Well, who wouldn't want to save their granny from hell? Lots of people bought these things. And the more that, that Martin Luther studied the Bible... It was like, on the one hand, he had the Bible here, and in the other hand, there's all these things in the culture he began to see. It's all the things in the church and the teachings he began to see, and he began to weigh the two things side by side, and he was noticing, whoa, there is a major difference between what the Bible says and what the culture is teaching me right now. And he was so angry at Johann Tetzel because he was leading people astray. This man was a fraud. He was a shyster and taking advantage of people, people in poverty, and doing what they thought was the right thing to do to help themselves and their families. Well, one of the things that the church was doing with this money that people like Johann Tetzel was doing with his indulgence money was to fund a major project that was going on in the city of Rome. Um, Martin Luther was really excited that he got invited to go to the city of Rome. That's the headquarters of the church. And when he went there, he kind of expected, well, this is the headquarters of the church. This is going to be like a deepening spiritual experience for me. I'm going to meet these really, really holy and sacred people. This is going to be fantastic. And so he went on this trip, and he, what he discovered when he got to Rome, it was literally the exact opposite. It broke his heart. Because he saw priests and bishops and different folks. There was immorality. There was corruption. And he didn't mince his words at all. He said, this place is like a, a harlot. This place is like prostituting itself for money and for power. It broke his heart because it's the church that he loved. It's the God that he loved. And the money that was being collected from all throughout Western Europe was being sent, spent primarily on this project to build this big building, which is St. Peter's Cathedral, which is in now what we call the Vatican City. Um, And this enormous and beautiful church was being built at that time, but it was also a very expensive project to build, and and that is a major reason why so much money was being collected. And It does take a lot of money to build something like this. Uh, People like Michelangelo at that time were needing to be paid to paint things like the Sistine Chapel. That's where a lot of the money had to go is for artisans and construction workers to build a beautiful cathedral like that. 
And it broke his heart, though, that, that ordinary everyday people who didn't know the word of God were, were participating in things like that, that that were not of God. And so this verse out of Romans 1.16 reminds me of Martin Luther. Martin Luther had a personality like a bull. Do you know that kind of personality? Just like he knew what was right and he didn't care if someone else disagreed with him or not because he knew exactly what he knew and he would say what exactly he believed to be the truth. But it reminds me of Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. And Martin Luther believed that he had to stand up. That his trip to Rome, it really brought him to the edge. He said, I'm done with this now. I've got to say something. He was no longer ashamed. He didn't want to keep his mouth shut. Uh, he, he believed what he had to say was so important because like the scripture says, it is the power of God that brings salvation to people believe. And right now, people aren't believing the gospel because they can't read it. They don't know what the Bible actually says about how to be saved. And so, because now he was at the edge and he realized that he needed to do something. This is this world-changing moment that he decided that he needed to come to in his life. It was on October 31st, 1517, Exactly 504 years ago today. Today is Reformation Sunday. It is the moment that we remember what Martin Luther did that day that changed the world. He picked up his hammer and he went over to the church door at Wittenberg and he took 95 reasons that he had written up as to how the church had erred in its teachings. 95 reasons of, of problems and issues that the church had. And he took his hammer and he hammered it into the door, which was like a bulletin board or a whiteboard of his day, and he put up his 95 theses up on the wall. That was a moment that changed history. And when he tacked those 95 theses up onto the door that day, his hope is that somebody was going to read these 95 reasons and debate him about it. Nobody did. Nobody wanted to debate Martin Luther about those 95 theses that he had posted up. But what's interesting is those 95 theses went further and more widespread than he could ever have dreamed. He just wanted to have a little debate with somebody at Wittenberg. But this document, these 95 theses, probably is the first viral document in world history <laughs> So the first thing that ever went viral, and the, the reason is that the printing press had just been invented, and people read these 95 reasons and loved what was written there. So much so they took it down and they made copies of it, and then they made copies of it, and it spread throughout all of the countries of Western Europe. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people were reading the 95 theses that went viral, and it began to change people's thoughts about the, the, what the church has the right to do, the authority to do, and what the Bible is supposed, what it, what it teaches us. Um, I've read through the 95 theses, and you're welcome to do that. But I'll kind of sum up some of the main points of what's written in it. Number one, one of the main things he talks about is how to be saved. He says, in my study of the Bible, which was extensive by that point, he went on and he got a doctorate in theology, and he was a professor of the book of Romans and Psalms. I mean, he knew his Bible really, really well. And he says, what the Bible actually teaches is the way to be saved has nothing to do whether a pope says you're saved or not, whether a bishop says you're saved or not, whether a priest says you're saved or not, whether the church says you're saved or not, or whether even you think you're saved or not. The way that you are saved is whether Jesus Christ saves you. That we are saved by Jesus Christ alone. Only God has the power to say whether a person is saved or not. This was his, his doctrine that we call now justification by faith alone, that we are saved not because of whether we are a good person or not. We are only saved because Jesus was good. And this is a really, really important point because when your day comes to stand before the throne of God, 
This is important to know, that when God now looks at you and your heart, which has sin in it like mine does, if Jesus Christ is in your heart, if you have said yes to Jesus Christ, in that moment when God looks into your heart, he won't see your heart. He sees the heart of Jesus Christ that is pure. And only because his son is in you and because he is pure are we then able to go to heaven. Thank God we're not saved because of our own righteousness. We're saved because of Jesus' righteousness. That's what the Bible says. And that's what Martin Luther was so passionate about. The other things that he writes about in the 95 Theses are the authority of the Pope and the authority of bishops and the authority of the church, which way overstep the bounds of what the Bible says. These are just men, he said. These are not God, and they don't have the authority to say these kinds of things or to believe these kinds of things that only God himself is able to say. And so these ideas were loved by so many people, and they were spread throughout the Western uh, European nations, and so many people loved them, but there is one person who really didn't like what Martin Luther was saying. That was the Pope. (laughs) This is Pope Leo. He for sure did not like what Martin Luther was teaching at all. And Pope Leo sent Martin Luther a warning letter. Martin Luther, you need to stop what you're doing or else, dot, dot, dot. You know what Martin Luther did with that letter from the Pope? He burned it, (laughs) which is a pretty bold thing to do. But that's the kind of man that he was. Um, He was given some ultimatums to stop. Stop teaching these kinds of heresies. And by the way, yes, he was called a heretic. Uh, He was eventually excommunicated from the church for his beliefs. And it got to the point he was brought before a tribunal, a courtroom. And he was given one last chance. Either you take these 95 theses and shred them and you apologize for them or face the consequences, which, I mean, let's be honest, he knew what the consequences were. He's going to be executed. So I want you to put yourself in his shoes for that moment and think about the choice. You're sitting in a courtroom, and you have two choices to make. You have to choose one. Number one is you apologize for all that you've written here, and if you do, you live. Or the other choice is you have the Bible, and you know what's written there. And you stick with what the Bible says is true, but if you stick with that, you die. It's a tough choice to make. I mean, if you're the one sitting there. And, and I, want, I think this is why this is such an important topic for us today, because I believe it's just as pertinent today as it was in 1517 when he tacked those theses onto that door. Because today I still think that the truth is in balance with culture. I mean, we know what the Bible says in so many things, and yet the weight of culture is really strong in our life. I mean, there's, there are things in our, our world today that we're supposed to believe because that's what the culture tells, tells us we're supposed to believe. But when you read the Bible and, and you use it as your authority in your life, you begin to see how different the culture of our world is versus what the Bible teaches us is God's word. So I will tell you that if you have an opportunity to be in the word, to read it, how, how else are you going to know that you're standing on the word of God unless you're reading it and it's an authority over your life? How do you know your political views are right? How do you know that your views, the way you've think, seen things your whole life are right unless you're constantly putting them to the test under the word of God? And so we have so many young t- people today and I would say if you have in your life a child, a grandchild, a niece, a nephew, a godchild, whatever, then you can pray for that child or if you have any authority to introduce the truth of Scripture to that person's life, um, use whatever opportunity you have. Because I want to tell you, our children are under immense pressure to believe and to live as culture teaches and not what the Scripture teaches. Martin Luther had that pressure. Um, and he, in that moment, had a choice to make. And as he sat there wondering about his options, this, I believe, is the most famous quote that we have from Martin Luther during his life. He said this, here I stand, God help me, I can do no other. He decided to stand for the word of God and scripture. 
knowing that probably he was going to be executed for it. Man, that's amazing, amazing, the boldness that he had. What's interesting, however, is that he never did die. I mean, people tried. Uh, they tracked him down. They hunted him down. He was on an execution list for a very, very long time, but he was so savvy. Uh, politically, he was able to find protection and just able to, to slip out of being executed all the time. And he, by this time, he was like a big celebrity, and he'd walk down the streets. If people knew that he was coming, people lined the streets just to get a glimpse of him. And so wherever he went, there were always crowds of people, so they couldn't find him alone long enough to be able to uh, execute, um, execute the warrant to arrest him and kill him. Uh, but many, many tried until the very, very end of his day. Um, Colossians 2.8 says this, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on the human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces, forces of this world rather than on Christ. And every day he lived these words to not be captive to the thoughts of the culture, but to make himself captive to the thoughts of Christ and to live for the purposes of Christ, standing upon the word of God. After this, after this he got quite a reputation for himself. The church labeled him as someone who was protesting. I mean, they called him a, a protestant. Protestant. And the name stuck. So that years later, people who followed the teachings of Martin Luther became known as Protestants. Protestants, those who protest. But I would say Martin Luther would say what he stood for wasn't just a protest against a teaching of the church. What he really was standing was something for something, which was the words of God from the scriptures. And so today, the movement that he had launched is uncalculable. I mean, literally, the shape of nations, the size of nations is changed because of the Protestant Reformation that he formed. Kings ascended to the throne and, and were taken off the throne because of the Protestant Reformation. Wars were fought. Many, many lives have been killed because of battles taking place over the Protestant Reformation. It, it, unbelievable how many things had changed. Um, even literacy improved because Martin Luther went on and translated the Bible into German. Well, people were now able to read the Bible for the first time and they wanted to get their kids educated. I mean, it, it transformed Germany because people wanted to read the Bible and, and so people were going back to school again. I mean, it transformed literacy and now today, there's about a billion, with a B, billion Christians on earth who trace their spiritual lineage back to the Reformation that Martin Luther launched. Anybody today who is an Anglican, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Methodist, Baptist, non-denominational, Pentecostal, any other, other denomination you can think of other than Eastern Orthodox or Roman Catholic, has to thank Martin Luther for saying, here I stand, I can do no other than stand upon the word of God. He went on and had an amazing life that, influenced so many people. And one of those things that stood out to a lot of people that he decided to change because of his reading of the word of God is he got married. <laughs> Here's a picture of his wife. Her name's Catherine. Um, she is a former nun. She was a nun and he was a monk. And Martin Luther reading the Bible realized there's nothing in the Bible that says that a priest or a monk has to be celibate. They don't have to stay unmarried. And so he decided to become married, and I'm kind of fortunate. I'm glad that he did, <laughs> because people like me who feel called to preach the word of God can go off, and we can, get a, I can have a family. I can get married. It's, it's because of the influence of Martin Luther upon uh, the, the culture of his day because of what he read. But of all the things, all the things that Martin Luther did, and they are many, there's the one thing I think stands above all of them that is the biggest difference, and that is understanding how a person is saved. He taught about how to be saved, justification by faith alone. So I want to put up the scripture again, Romans 1, 17, and share with you how his reading of the Bible changed the way he understood the Bible. Paul wrote this, for the gospel, for in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed. Notice that, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last that it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Before he had been taught that 
You are saved by being perfect. The righteous people will be saved. And then he realized that's not what at all that it says in the scripture. It doesn't say people who are perfect will be saved. It says the righteousness of God will be revealed in Jesus Christ. Meaning the, the righteousness that saves us is Jesus' righteousness. It's only when we come to accept Jesus Christ in our life that we're saved because of the righteousness of of Christ. This is good news. And when he realized that's how you're saved and it's not by good works, it's not by being perfect, he, it's like a weight was taken off of him. He was able to sleep at night when he was full of joy. Realizing this good news was not just for him, but it opened up those who were in bondage, not knowing the gospel throughout Western Europe and the rest of the world to me. There is nothing more important than this doctrine he discovered, which maybe that seems like a minor point to you to discover a doctrine called justification by faith alone, but it was unlocking that one key that led people to be able to know what the gospel actually said and how we're actually saved by Christ alone. I mean, that has eternal consequences for billions of people. Martin Luther's life was changed and the world was changed. And it's interesting how 504 years later, here we are, still teaching this doctrine to so many people who've never heard it before. People don't know how to be saved. People worry about their salvation and they don't know that it's through Jesus Christ alone. And it was the year 1934 that there was a pastor named Michael King who showed up in Germany, didn't know any of this stuff, didn't know the story of Martin Luther at least not uh, what he had known before and what he learned. But he was impressed so much that he went home and changed his own name and he changed his son's name. Why? Because he learned in the story of Martin Luther that there was a man who loved the word of God so much so that he was willing to put his life on the line to stand up for the word of God against what culture was teaching And can you see how Martin Luther King Jr. lived out that principle in his own life? Preached the word of God. Stood up for the word of God, even at threat of his own life. To preach against what he saw in his culture was not with the word of God. It transformed the way that he thought. And the word of God always transforms us. And I want to encourage you, because you have the words of God, to make that part of your life. And if there's someone in your life that you can influence, especially young people who are so influenced by the culture today, to pray for that child. Uh, and if you can bring them to the word of God in any way that you do that, in any way that God puts on your life to do so. Now, I was curious today, you know, because at one point, uh, Pope Leo called Martin Luther's teaching poison. It was poison to the world. And I was curious today, does the Roman Catholic Church today still think Martin Luther's teachings are poison? And so I did a little bit of research to find out if that was true or not. And lo and behold, I found what our current Pope Francis recently said about Martin Luther. Uh, This is a quote from Pope Francis. He said, back in that time, the church was not exactly a model to imitate. There was corruption in the church. There was worldliness. There was attachment to money and to power. And in this, Martin Luther protested. And today, Lutherans and Catholics and Protestants, all of us agree on the doctrine of justification. And on this point, which is very important, he did not err. He made a medicine for the church. Notice that last word, medicine for the church. That's very intentional because the previous pope had said that he was poison for the church. Now, what Luther taught wasn't against what the church teaches. It is the very core of biblical teaching. And the church that he ended up leaving ended up coming around back to what the word of God actually says about that. He made a great impact even on his own church where he came from. The word of God transformed the church and the world, bringing us medicine. And I believe that the gospel is medicine. It's powerful. It's powerful in a couple ways. This medicine, if you don't take it, leads to death, certain death. And the medicine, if you do take it, leads to life, eternal life. 
And so today, I want to pray for you as we close. That you would pray, you get right with the Lord. You thank God for being your righteousness because it's not upon ourselves. This is good news for every single one of us. And pray that the word of God, which God has given to all of us, you might, you might have a hunger and a thirst just like Martin Luther did, that God would continue to transform your life into the person that God wants you to become. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for the power and the boldness of this man, Martin Luther, who transformed the whole world. And really what transformed it is simply just going down and digging up the good news that you had in your word all along. And we thank you that you have good news for each one of us that while we all are sinners and while we all fall away and none of us is perfect, that you still made a way for us to be saved. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that he comes to us and he offers that way to freedom and life. And we pray that that freedom that we can receive in Jesus Christ not stays just with us, but, but it's something that we, we proclaim to the people in our world, the people that come across our path, that we not hold on to it, that just like Martin Luther, we do whatever we can do to be a missionary to the people that God sends to us in our life. God, we thank you for this gospel that transforms. We thank you and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, y'all. So uh, if you'd like to stand, we're going to sing this last song. It's called We Believe. And um, like Pastor Mike was saying, and, and I'll just say this, we can't thrive as Christians without reading the Word of God and without staying in the Word of God. And that's just a fact. Um, so this last song is called We Believe, and uh, it is about the core of what we believe, the gospel of Jesus. One, two.
Christ, your son, that we are saved, and only Jesus Christ that we are saved, not by good works, not by somebody else telling us that we've done good and that we deserve to go to heaven. It is only by your son who died for us, the sacrifice that he made to cover our sin and our imperfections, God. And it's his righteousness that you look at when when you look at us, you see Jesus. And that is good. (laughs) That is good news. Because without that, would not be good. So I just pray that our faith in you continues to grow. The desire to read your word stays in our hearts, to grow closer to you. That is my prayer. We love you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all have a good week. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And He's coming back. He's coming back again. Good job, y'all. That was awesome.